there's a Christian comedian. His name is Ken Davis, and, and he tells a story about waiting for a sign from God. This Christian gets on this empty city bus, and he sits down, and Lord, he prays. Lord, if, if you want me to speak to someone about you, please give me a sign. And at the next stop, another passenger boards and he goes all the way to the back and he sits down right next to the Christian. The passenger asks, do you know anything about Jesus? And the Christian excuses himself for a moment and he slowly bows his head. And he once again, he prays, Lord, if you really want me to talk to this stranger, I need just one more sign. Please turn the bus driver into an armadillo. You know, isn't that just like us sometimes? We ask God for a sign and, and he gives it to us and we ignore it. When it comes right down to it, what the problem is, is that we really just don't trust God. We don't trust him enough to follow his leading. This morning, we're going to be looking at a man who did just that. He may not have been praying for armadillos, but he might as well have been praying for armadillos. So let's learn from his experience so that we can be better prepared when God works in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we do want to thank you for your word. And Lord, as we open it up this morning, Father, I pray that you would be right in the midst of it. That Lord, it would be your message to us that comes through loud and clear. Father, open our hearts, open our, our minds, open our ears to hear from you this morning. Lord, use this time. Use this time to change us, to glorify yourself. And Father, to, to help us to learn more about you. Father, to, to deepen our relationship with you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the next few weeks, we're preparing for Christmas. Right? We're going to be looking at how different people, how different people reacted to God working in their lives in preparation for the first Christmas that was some 2,000 years ago. We're going to be looking at different kinds of people that God spoke to and different people that God used uh, leading up to the birth of Jesus Christ. This morning, we're going to start with the first of, of these people. He was a very religious man. Very, very religious man. He came from a great family. He had a great position. He was part of the in crowd, you know. God spoke to him in a highly unusual way, and it uh, caught him by surprise, actually. And, and I, don't think, I don't think that he was really prepared for it. The passage we're going to be looking at this morning is Luke uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 5 through 25. So let's see. Let's see what happened. Luke chapter five, uh, chapter 1, starting in verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of the God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well along in years. So here Luke gives us a little bit of background information about what's going on. He tells us that Herod was the king over Judea. Now, Herod, this Herod was Herod the Great. He was the, the king uh, from around 37 BC to 4 BC. He is the Herod that was ruling at the time of the birth of Christ. He was the one who, in order to protect his title of king of the Jews, ordered the death of all the boys under the age of two around Bethlehem after a visit for some, from some magi. He was crafty. He was cruel. He had consolidated his power through the use of the sword. Now, during this time, there was another man, Zechariah. And Zechariah was a priest, which means that he came, he, he was a descendant of Aaron. God had set up the, the Aaronic priesthood 
uh, at the time of the Exodus. And so you had to be a descendant of Aaron to be a priest. And uh, so Zechariah was, and Luke also tells us that, that his wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. In other words, they were both part of the priestly line that God had established. Now, they were upright. It says that they were righteous. That doesn't mean that they were perfect. It means that they followed God. They did the best that they could to follow him. Okay, they, they, they uh, kept the commandments. They also did more. Theirs was a, a heartfelt following of God. It wasn't just an external kind of thing like so many people back then and like so many people today. You know, you do the moral thing, you do the right thing, but your heart is not right with God. But they followed him. They were faithful and they were sincere in what they did. But there was a problem. There was a problem. Zechariah and Elizabeth were childless. They had no children. Now, to us, that sounds like a bad thing, a right? sad kind of thing. You know, it's, it's, it's difficult. You know, I hate being a pastor on Mother's Day. Okay? It really, it is horrible being a pastor on Mother's Day because there are so many women who cannot have children, who desperately want children. And so coming up with a sermon, it's, it's difficult. But back then, it was much worse. Back then, it was seen as, as, as a displeasure of God. Okay? That God was, was punishing you for something. Back in Deuteronomy, God had told the Israelites that if they were careful to obey the law, that they would be blessed more than any other people. None of their men or women would be childless. So to not have a child would be seen as a punishment from God. It was also a situation that was looked down upon by the society around them. It was embarrassing. Elizabeth called her barrenness a disgrace among the people. In 1 Samuel, Penina constantly berated Hannah because she was unable to have children. In Genesis 30, Rachel cried out to God, Give me children or I will die. It was extremely important. But at least in Rachel and in Hannah's cases, there was still time to have children. And God did provide children for them. Elizabeth and Zechariah, though, were a little different case. Remember, they were well along in years. It was past their time to have children. In spite of their disappointment, though, Zechariah and Elizabeth continued to serve God. Luke makes sure that we know that regardless of their circumstances, they continued to observe all the Lord's commands and regulations blamelessly. So let's see what happens. Verse 8. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So Zechariah, we were told earlier, was part of the priestly division of Abijah. You see, the priests were divided into 24 different divisions. And uh, each division served at the temple for one week, twice a year. And then they all served together during the time of the great feasts. And it was during one of the weeks of Abijah that Zechariah received some good news. Twice a day, morning and evening, uh, there were sacrifices. And the priests were chosen to go in and uh, burn incense before the Lord at the altar of incense. That's in the holy place of the temple. You know, only the priests were allowed into the temple. Right? And only the high priest was allowed into the Holy of Holies and only once a year. So uh, it was an opportunity of a lifetime that Zechariah was chosen to go and to burn incense before the Lord. You know, there were around 18,000 priests at the time of Jesus. 
And so to be chosen was a great honor. And it was a, a unique privilege. In fact, in fact, if you were ever chosen to go into the temple to perform one of the, the duties, you could never be chosen again. It was literally a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The priests that served, they were chosen by lot. Okay, the Jews believe that, that nothing happens by chance. In Proverbs, we read that the lot is ca cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And so this really was Zechariah being chosen by lot was God's way of choosing Zechariah to come before him and burn incense. And when the time came for the burning of incense, it was Zechariah's big moment. He'd been waiting for an opportunity like this for his whole life. And he took the first steps into the temple, very carefully carrying the incense that he was going to burn before the Lord. And as he goes in and takes those first steps, the people who are out in the courtyard stop. And they begin to pray. It was a huge time of worship. Everything in the temple grounds came to a stop. I know you've all seen on, on TV or maybe been there at a big sporting event where something had happened and we're going to have a moment of silence for whatever, right? And how, how, how deathly still the place gets. Imagine that in the temple. People are bustling around. They're not sitting in seats. They're all going and doing things. And Zechariah goes inside, and as he steps in, everything comes to a stop. Time of worship. Zechariah moves slowly, and as he was carrying the special incense with him, he didn't want to rush this ceremony. I mean, it was going to be the only time that, that, that he was going to be able to do it, and he waited so long. And here, inside, Zechariah felt connected to the whole history of the people of God. <clears throat> God himself at Mount Sinai had given Moses the formula for the incense that Zechariah carried. Thoughts of the exodus, the, the wandering in the wilderness, the, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of, cloud, of fire by night invaded his mind. He envisioned the walls of, of the mighty Jericho tumbling down before an astonished people of God. You recall the stories of King David, the wisdom of King Solomon. Yes, there was discipline for his people. They had uh, been exiled, but God had been faithful to the people even then. He'd been faithful even when the people had not. And God brought his people back to their land. And the worship of Yahweh continued. The temple had been rebuilt. And one day, one day, the people would be free again. God had promised a Messiah, a rescuer of his people. Zechariah continued past the table of the showbread. The 12 loaves reminding him of God's continual provision for his people. And then there he was at the altar of incense. Zechariah must have been overwhelmed with the responsibility that he'd been given. He placed the incense on the altar and he touched it with a hot coal. And the incense that burned before the, the Lord represented the prayers of the people of God. And as the smoke from the incense climbed up the curtain, the curtain that separated the altar of incense from, from, from the Holy of Holies, you could sense the prayers of the people being raised up. The world outside for Zechariah just faded into the distance as the enormity of what was taking place took hold of the priest. To be separated from the very seat of God among his people by, by just this curtain would have been overwhelming. It was truly a, a, an awesome privilege 
that God had granted to him. He stood there for a moment, burning every detail of, of this place into his memory because he would never see it again. But as Zechariah stood before the altar of incense, something unusual happened. Luke continues in uh, verse 11. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Imagine what a sight that must have been for Zechariah. There he is. He's enthralled with the majesty of the holy place, the majesty of the temple, and he's lost in worship. And suddenly an angel appears there standing right there by the altar of incense and the lampstand, and Zechariah was startled. I don't know about you, but I think I would jump too. He's standing there, worshiping all of a sudden, boom, there's somebody standing in front of him. He was gripped with fear. I think that would be a common enough response. And the angel, he tried to calm Zechariah. Do not be afraid. Well, that was probably easier said than done. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. The angel spoke to him personally. He knew his name. And and the angel had a message for him. Your prayer has been heard. Now that brings up an interesting question. Doesn't God hear all of our prayers? And, And the short answer is that yes, God does hear our prayers. But that's not really what the angel meant. That's not what he was really saying here. You see, when the Bible talks about God hearing our prayers, it means that God is acting. God is doing something because of those prayers, something on our behalf. In Exodus, God tells Moses, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. You see, the people had been crying out for a long time, for hundreds of of years, but God was preparing to move on their behalf. In Exodus 2, it says God heard their groaning. In Malachi, the Lord listened and heard those who feared him talking to one another, and a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. In the book of Acts, An angel of the Lord tells Cornelius that God had heard his prayer, which resulted in Peter coming to see him. God had heard Zechariah's prayer. And God was about to move on his behalf. Zechariah had apparently been praying about a child. Now, this could have been a current prayer, or it could have been a prayer that Zechariah and Elizabeth had prayed for quite a while. Maybe it wasn't even one of their current uh, uh, requests that they have of the Lord. They were, after all, advanced in years, beyond childbearing age. In any case, God was about to answer his prayer. More than likely, that wasn't Zechariah's only prayer. As a righteous man, he would have also been praying for the salvation of Israel. The angel was very specific. He was very specific about how God was going to work. Elizabeth was going to have a son. It was Elizabeth that would bear 
the child, not someone else. I guess the angel told him that, God told him that through the angel, so that they wouldn't have to go through that whole Hagar and Ishmael thing again. And there are to name their son John, which means Yahweh has been generous. You know, sometimes like here, God gets very specific in the things that he wants us to do. At other times, he's he's not as specific. I mean, think about it. Moses was to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Man, it's a big job. But he didn't know the whole plan ahead of time. God had told him what he needed to know as he went along. You know, in my life, there's been times when God's been very specific about what I'm supposed to do. You know, when I first saw Susan for the very first time, I told my buddy, I said, that's the woman I'm going to marry. It took a while to convince Susan, though. I mean, a long while. The first time that Susan and I visited this church, God made it very clear that we were not supposed to be here. I'm serious, we weren't supposed to be here. And we left. And about a year and a half later, we felt like God was calling us to come back and to visit the church again. And we came back. And before we even got, excuse me, through the, through the front doors, I knew that I was supposed to be. Didn't know why. I don't know anything, but God said, this is where you are supposed to be. And then there's times when it's been not nearly so specific. You know, when God called me to go to seminary, I had no idea why because I did not want to be a pastor didn't want to do it I had a very successful business but I went to seminary y'all have heard the story as time went on and I prayed about it and as I studied and as I talked to other students and as I talked to different people it became clear that God was calling me to be a pastor see God will reveal his plan in time in his time We just need to be prepared to listen and to follow his leading. Look at what the angel told Zechariah. He's going to have a child. He's going to have a son. That son will be a joy and a delight, not just to Zechariah, but to many. He's going to be great in the sight of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, even from before his birth. He's going to bring many in Israel back to God. He's the one who's going to go in spirit and power, in the spirit and power of Elijah, and make straight the way of the Lord. Turn the fathers, the heart of the fathers, to their children, and and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Remember, Zechariah was a priest. And he knew his scriptures. He knew that this came right out of Malachi chapter 4. And Isaiah chapter 40, where, where, where God tells him there's going to be someone who's going to come and make the way straight for the Lord, to prepare the people for the Lord. God, who had been silent for 400 years, was about to move again for his people. And Zechariah's son was going to be a big part of that. For a priest, that should have been exciting news. I mean, he was going to have a child. It's going to, going to remove the stigma uh, of childlessness. It will be a miraculous child. He and Elizabeth were way too old to have children. So not only will his child remove the stigma, but he will also be a sign of God's great favor. He's having a son. That was very important. Someone to carry on the family name. His son's name would be great in the sight of God. I mean, what could be better than that? His son was going to start a great revival throughout Israel. He was going to be a great prophet. He was going to be used to help fulfill the prophecy of Malachi, the coming of the Messiah. This was exciting stuff. Let's see what Zechariah did. (laughs) Verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. (laughs) 
So let's put this in a little more modern vernacular here. Zechariah says, you're kidding, right? Let me tell you why this is not going to work. Think about this. Here's Zechariah. He's standing in the middle of the temple. One of 18,000 priests to be standing at that very spot, at that very moment. Through an angel, Gabriel, God has just told him that he's heard all the desperate prayers that Zechariah and Elizabeth had lifted up to him through the years. He's going to answer the greatest prayer request in Zechariah's life with the greatest gift that Zechariah could imagine. And not only is he going to relieve Zechariah's personal anguish, but he's going to work through his son to bring salvation to the world. Zechariah wasn't prepared to believe it. See, it seems to me, Zechariah wants God to work. But only in a way that makes sense to Zechariah. Only in a way that Zechariah wants. As far as Zechariah is concerned, what God is doing doesn't make any sense. Now, don't misunderstand. Zechariah was a very devout man. He was very committed to serving God. He was wise in the eyes of the world. He was a worship leader. There's no doubt that he loved God and he desired nothing but the best for God. If anyone should be able to accept the fact that the Lord is beginning to work, it should be him. But Zechariah, he had God in a box. As far as Zechariah was concerned, God could only work in a way that Zechariah wanted him to. He wants God to work, but he wants God to work in a way that makes sense to Zechariah. But God doesn't always work that way. Many times when God begins to work, he pushes us out of our comfort zone. When God works, he begins to broaden our view of the situations. When God begins to work in the world, he begins by working in us. But a lot of times we're like Zechariah. We try to keep God contained in a box. We think that God can only work in ways that we understand. But really, what we do is we build a box that limits our understanding of God. Our understanding of the majesty and the power of God. So many times, what God has to do first is to help us break out of the box that we have trapped ourselves into. Now understand this. God is going to work in the world. And he wants to work through us. The the, the question is, though, are we prepared to let him do that? Zechariah, Zechariah wasn't quite sure that he believes God's message. It seems to me that Zechariah believes that God answers prayer, but he has no real expectation of God answering. I ran across a great quote from Nelson Mandela the other day. One cannot be prepared for something while secretly believing that it will not happen. Are we like that? You know, we pray and we pray and we pray for something. But when God answers and he starts to work, we're not ready to accept it. When God starts to move, people jump on board. It may be scary. That's okay. If God is working, what can stop it? Trust him. Join him where he's working. Zechariah, 
Zechariah responded to the angel's message by asking, how can I be sure we're too old? Zechariah wanted some kind of sign to validate the message as if an angel appearing before you in the midst of the temple, calling you by name, relating intimate details of your prayer life and of your life with your wife wasn't enough of a sign. Let's see what happened, 19 and 20. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. The angel assured Zechariah that, that he was from God and was, was acting on God's authority. And then Gabriel told him, as the comedian Bill Engvall used to say, here's your sign. Zechariah got the sign that he asked for. He would be unable to speak until, excuse me, until the time that the baby was born. The sign was also a rebuke to Zechariah for his lack of faith. God's plan was going to be worked out in the life of Zechariah and Elizabeth, but Zechariah would be silent until it did. But the people outside, the people outside the temple, they're beginning to grow restless. You know, Zechariah had been in the temple for a very long time, and he didn't have a preacher in there going on and on and on. Verses 21 and 22. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained une unable to speak. So when Zechariah came out, he stood before the temple stood before the people, and they expected him to pronounce a blessing to end the time of worship. But he was unable to do so. The sign that the angel had described had already taken effect. There could no longer be any doubt. Zechariah had the greatest news that he could possibly have, but he's unable to share it. See, God's plan was going to be carried out, no doubt about that. But think of the blessings that Zechariah missed out on in the meantime. Verses 23 through 25, when his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my dis disgrace among the people. So Zechariah returned home at the end of his week of service, and what he had thought was impossible happened. Elizabeth was pregnant. God's plan began to unfold. Elizabeth was quick to give the Lord credit for the work in her life. She was ready to go. The forerunner of Christ was on his way. John would indeed turn many in Israel back to God. He became the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. So that all mankind, so that all mankind would see God's salvation. God was going to use John to prepare the people of Israel for the coming Messiah. But before he did that, God was preparing the heart of John's father, Zechariah. See, Zechariah thought that he knew God, but he encountered him in a whole new way, standing there in the temple that day. You know, this morning, as we look forward to Christmas, Allow God to work in your heart. Allow Him to prepare the way for a deeper relationship with Him. Allow Him to work in your life and allow Him to work through you. And when you see Him starting to work, don't hesitate. 
You, you don't need another sign. If you see God working somewhere, that's enough of a sign. And if God prompts you to do something, understand that that is the sign. Join him. Join him where he's working, where he wants you to be working. Be prepared. God wants to work in your life. And he may be using you to make straight the way of the Lord in order to impact someone else's life. Pray for God to use you. Be ready to act. And don't pray for armadillos. Father, we want to thank you for your word. And Lord, so many times we're, we got to admit, we're a lot like Zechariah. You point us somewhere, you say, go get them, go do this, go do that. And Lord, we just can't see how that's possibly going to work. But Lord, we do know you and we know that you do work. And Father, we know that nothing can stop you. As Paul said, if the Lord is with us, who can stand against us? So, Lord, I pray that you would make us bold. Father, that you would make us prepared to hear from you, to move in whatever direction, in whatever way you call us to move. Help us to be more like John and less like Zechariah. Father, help us to boldly proclaim Jesus Christ. Father, I pray also that it's not just sharing Christ. It's at, at, at we're discussing here. It's everything in our life. Father, as you point us in different directions, as you move us in different ways, Father, help us to be prepared to act. Help us to be prepared to follow you no matter where you send us, no matter what you call us to do. Lord, we rely on you. We have nothing without you. Everything we have is yours. So use us, Lord, in any way that you desire. Help us to be prepared. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.